also we are going to say ss is equal to this and uh, we are going to decide so let's say uh, f interface uh, is equal to so let's say is equal to f on the left so one to end minus one so so this is saying i first choose on the left and then i'm going to loop for i goes from one to length of uh, f interface so, so let's actually make it easier so so let's say f interface is equal to just a, a, a empty array and uh, so let's do a loop to length of u and uh, f interface well let's do it to two to the length of u because we we have one less uh, we are only computing the we only need to use this upwind formula on the interior interfaces right okay so f interface is equal to f interface and i want to append one more on the f interface and the one i want to append would be depend uh it would depend if ss of i minus one is greater than zero then I want to use which side if it's greater than zero I want to use the left side yes I want to use f of i minus one right because I'm looping i goes from two to the end if I'm looping from i goes from one to length of u minus one then this would be i this would also be i else f interface is equal to f interface f of i any questions about this f interface assignment okay uh, so let me make it let me also append uh, the zero and uh, zero at the both ends so this is the boundary conditions we use the same boundary conditions as we used last time and then dudt would be equal to f interface 1 to end minus 1 minus f interface 2 to end uh, divide by delta x so my delta x would be equal to 1 divided by length of u all right so that's our upwind scheme. Yes? Yes. Thank you. All right. Any other thing you found in the program? Yeah, let's try it. So uh, I'm going to use a. Uh, um, so I'm going to use, uh, let's say, again, the same initial condition, x equal to x interface is equal to uh, a link space of 0, 1, and uh, let's do 1 or 1, so that n is equal to 100. So x would be equal to x interface, 1 to end minus 1, plus x interface 2 to end divided by 2 so oops. yeah so x is going to be uh, in the middle of the two axes I'm going to use u equal to sine of x times 2 pi so if I plot x and u it'll be this sine wave we used in our last lecture okay so let's say we set u is equal to u uh, u zero equal to u transpose uh that's for od45 i think it accepts a column vector and tu is equal to od45 ddt upwind we solve it uh last time we solve it for uh for a point one seconds and u zero okay so 
let's do close plot x and u so this is still fine this is uh, uh, also our last lecture we had the same thing but I think we saw a problem when we saw it for 0.3 seconds and this time when we saw for 0.3 seconds we still get a good solution right so so let's do end colon so we get a solution that has a shockwave sitting in the middle and let's actually solve it for one second we do the same we see okay we get a we got a we got a shockwave and uh, the magnitude of this shockwave has diminished from size about 1 to all the way to 0.4 if we plot all the solution at once so we see the sine wave goes into the shockwave and uh, the shockwave starts to decay all right so that seems uh, a nice solution and you can it's interesting you can see also see like how OD45 adapts the time step over here initially it chooses pretty conservative time step and uh, it starts to know it can cause them and at the, this point uh, it's, it's, uh, it starts to also when the shockwave forms it looks like uh, the time step is decreased also a little bit any questions about this upwind scheme yes so the error comes from uh, so you, we, we can think of several ways to think of where the error come from so in in a Taylor series analysis you can think of the error coming from the dispersion we have a second order scheme we have uh, we know like a second order scheme from our previous experience has very little dissipation if any and uh, has a lot of dispersion error and the amount of dispersion error is proportional to delta x square and it's also proportional to some derivative of the function I think it's third order derivative if I'm not wrong so so it's proportional to third order derivative times delta x square if you have a discontinuity how big is the third order derivative it's gonna be huge right it's gonna be when you have something that is very oscillatory like like a shockwave you have a very very large third order derivative so that causes a lot of dispersion error so from that perspective last lecture we also looked at the central difference scheme being something that conserves the cubed solution so the conservation of these higher order statistics is going to uh, of the higher order quantity is going to prevent the solution from getting dissipated right because because if you have a solution like this at later time it definitely has a has a smaller integrated u cubed than the original solution that's also something the second order uh, central flux scheme cannot capture correctly uh, the the reason for choosing that is one it uh, uh, so from von Neumann stability analysis uh, actually from the modified equation analysis we we see that using an upwinding scheme is going to introduce numerical dissipation right and it is actually dissipation that we need over here we need the scheme to be dissipated by the shock wave the shock wave is actually a uh, an inherently dissipative phenomenon and uh, if, if you look at a shock wave of a real fluid flow of like aerodynamics uh, in a supersonic flow the shock wave is very very thin so so here like mathematically a shock wave is a discontinuity in a real physics you don't really have any discontinuities but you have something extremely thin it's so thin that the shock wave is on the order of like 10 to 100 of the the mean free path of the molecules so it's like really really small and the dissipation <coughs> so although the shock wave is very thin the amount of physical dissipation occurring during inside the shock wave is is massive that's just because the the land scale is so small and molecules from one side goes to the other side and uh, they mix together the amount of uh, 
dissipation. It's, it's, so a lot of dissipation is appearing there. So even though we have an inviscid equation, we approximate the equation as inviscid, there is still a lot of dissipation going on at these continuities. And that is like the physical reason why we need a, a dissipative scheme to resolve discontinuities. That satisfies what you are uh, curious okay. about. Any other questions? And in fact, a lot of uh, modern numerical methods, they are trying to be high order away from the shock waves, but at the shock waves, you need a lot of numerical dissipation because you can never be, your grid can never resolve the shock wave. If your grid can resolve the shock wave, if your grid size is actually like 10 times the uh, mean free path of the molecules, you don't need any numerical dissipations, you just need physical dissipations. You put the amount of viscosity of air uh, into the scheme and you can have the appropriate amount of dissipation. But your grid can never resolve that, so that in that case you need numerical dissipation to do the same amount of work. Yes? If your grid could resolve that, can you just use finite differencing? If your grid can resolve that, yes, you can use finite differencing and uh, uh, with with not with not with this equation, but with the equation that includes the physical viscosity. So include a second order derivative in x term, and then you can yeah you can use finite difference. You actually converge to a real.